Okay, so these guys were having an, an interesting conversation and I had to stop them to set this up because I want you to listen what they're saying. I, I guess it's awesome. Just check this out. Okay, so we're, um, before Vlad interrupted the uh, discussion, we were having a casual conversation and now we've moved around a little bit, but we'll get back into it and uh, talk about what we were actually going through. Because Amy and I are both musicians, we both speak the same language, but I, we're gonna lead off where Amy was just getting into when I started to get really excited. And that was the hand technique. The that hand you, technique yeah, and, that you and how, we, how we approach harp, piano, and what you were saying about the drums. So yes. you were saying that with the drums, it's all about this action, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah, and you had me doing this little exercise. So. Which I'll show them in a couple of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, that's so similar to what we do at the harp, and it also resembles what we do at the piano, and so we're comparing and digging into things. So at the harp, our fundamental action is the closure action. And it has to do with the way the muscles work in the arm, what's connected to where. If you know much about anatomy, then you know that the joints of the furthest out joints of your fingers, and I won't go into all the technical names, but these joints out here at the very end of the finger are operated by muscles that reside up here in the arm. And they're connected via tendons through the wrist. And these joints also are operated by muscles in the arm connected via tendons. This is the only set of joints in the hand that actually has muscles controlling the motion right here in the hand. Well, if you think about um, some of the things you were talking about with performance injury risk and overuse injury and that sort of thing, some of the most common places for injury are in the wrist and in the arm and in the elbow because things like carpal tunnel and tendonitis and all of those things stem from overuse of or or stress use of these parts of the mechanism. But this is, this is where it gets so interesting. Everybody, you've got to check this out because the relationships are incredible on this. As Amy said, their movement is more the closure of the hand. And I've got an exercise which I'm going to quickly show you and then we're going to talk a bit more about what we're doing. If you have the courage to do what I'm about to show you, because it's painful, but you do it, it won't hurt you, but it's painful, you make the A-OK -okay sign, like you're saying A-OK. -okay. You stretch your fingers out to their full extent. Then what you do is you close your fingers so it hits the fleshy part underneath the thumb. So there's open, closed. And then the exercise is this, you just do as fast as you can. And you just keep doing that. I'll let you guys look after that. Do it for about three minutes and see how you non feel stop. after the three minutes. Yeah, you're not allowed to stop and you need to go as fast as you can. So, but what, what's so, so amazing about this is the similarities in what we're doing with this closed and open hand. Exactly, because, because on the harp, we don't do the A-OK -okay sign, but we do focus on closing all the fingers from the core of the hand, the center of the hand, and you want it to close down over the fleshy part. We don't want to have this curling action happening or, or picking like this. We don't want to have pinkies pointing out. We don't want to have hooks in our thumbs. All of this business, which is going to cause stress injury over time if you are doing a significant amount of playing. Everyone is different. Some people survive longer than others before they have problems. And occasionally you meet somebody who seems superhuman and they never have problems yeah, yeah. for whatever reason. But the majority of us are perfectly normal human beings where we end up with problems if we do it wrong. Exactly. For and, an extended length of time. And here's the thing. As a heavy metal drummer, as I play, and for those of you who don't know, I played 60, uh, the drum set for 60 hours straight to raise awareness for people with disabilities. A number of 2004 was when I did this. And it was to raise awareness for people with disabilities. It was a world record at the time. Now, these motions that we're talking about, and the one that I've just been showing all of you, um, there's reasons we do this. It helps to strengthen the muscles, but there's something even more significant about it. And, excuse me. That's this movement that we do to prevent ourselves from getting wrist injuries, carpal tunnel syndrome, elbows. Totally, for, totally. Right. For drummers, a lot of it's and in the, the shoulders. shoulders. Same with harpists. So let, let me, because we're in my studio right now, um, I'm going to pull a snare drum forward here. Now, 
when we were talking about that position of the fingers, if I take my drumstick and I place it between my fingers and I curl my fingers around, the way I'm playing it is actually this way. And there's a thing I teach my students where they can play with their fingers. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Where they do that. Got it. Okay, yeah. so you're, again, it's that open and closed hand yeah. movement that you're and, talking about that And the you game do. I give my students is to see how long you can get a clapping sound with one hand. And you notice that with the harp, I don't know if it's the same with the drum, but with the harp, there's a bit of a wrist action as well. It, there is exactly as you, a wrist As you action. retract, it's, it's, it's biomechanics, it's basic. If we are completely relaxed and hanging with our arm by our side, everything is extended and loose. As we begin to pick that up and we start putting angles in our body, we angle here. Well, that's going to pull these, this a bit tighter here, which means this is going to hang down here. And notice that the fingers are still pointing towards the floor. It's still very relaxed and rounded. Now, as a harpist, I have taught my thumbs that when they are relaxed, they go in a rest in a certain direction, which is very natural. Same with piano. It's, it's, it's the grasping action, which is one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of mammals. Yes, yes. The ability to grasp. And we can divide the hand essentially in half. The fingers are half, and this other half belongs to the thumb. And they oppose each other. Hence which the opposable is thumb. The opposable idea. thumb. And we use this so much in the way we approach technique and the instruments. Well, of course, with an opposing thumb like this, it puts my thumb underneath my fingers. On the harp, I've taught my thumb that when it opposes, it's going to travel along the side. Well, it's, it's placed along the side, so it can do that without destroying the whole biomechanics of the setup. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that you have your thumb underneath, which right. is more akin to piano playing. But, but again, <laughs> and this is where this gets really interesting. If, if you think about being relaxed, if you were to take your hands and just lift them up to here, yeah. you don't sit there with your hands stretched <clears throat> out. That, that's uncomfortable. Your hands will naturally fall in a position where the fingers are slightly curved, the thumb will droop, and the wrist will actually drop down. You should be able to do this with your hand. Absolutely. And, and you also can see this in art, visual art, paintings. Remember that famous painting with the hand of God reaching out and, and the position that it's, it's resting in. It is so beautifully illustrative of all the fundamentals that we take into account when we go to the harp or the piano, or it sounds or like in drums. his case, the drums. And, and, people... and I would argue probably any instrument that uses the hands is going to be based on the same principles because it's simple biomechanics. Well, and the thing is, is people think that drummers are just slamming on things, or you might think that harpists are very gentle. No, it, 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 it's not that. It's aligning your body with physics so that you're remaining relaxed but which will then allow you endurance, but you can also create power. So let me quickly demonstrate here. I take my hand nice and loose. I put my drumstick into my hand, which if in a relaxed position, the natural position, the thumb will go across from the index finger. But like Aunt Amy was saying on the harp, your thumbs can be on top as she demonstrated to me when I did my lesson with her. Well, in drumming, there's a position called French grip. The thumbs are on top. Uh-huh. And yeah. they're okay. So now I'm doing it this way. Uh-huh. And of course, French grip was invented by, well, actually Napoleon's drummers used to use it, uh, of course, from France. And then there's the extreme opposite, which is the Germanic grip. Guess where that was made? There, the palms are down, my index and thumbs are together, my fingers are gently curled around the stick, and now it's more of a rotating wrist action. So I've got this Does happening. that use more of the, of the shoulder rotation? It uses nothing of nothing. the shoulder. Okay, so no, it's just it's the all wrist. In the wrist. Think okay. about knocking on a door. Right, okay. That's the position you're doing. Now okay, okay, right, right, right. Because when I teach my beginning students on the harp or piano, we do this yo-yo game. Okay. You play, you're, you're playing with a yo-yo. Drop, come back, drop, yep. come back. Yep. So it's the same... It's the same thing, essentially, right? It, it, exactly, yeah, and there's that knocking motion. Uh -huh. But it, it gets more exciting than that. So we have these positions where we're relaxed, so I can use the technique that I need when I'm playing what I'm supposed to be playing. But this drooping and the relaxation of the wrist, there's two, way, 
two essential ways for drummers to play. There's actually six, but I'm not going to do them. I'm just going to talk about the two fundamental ways. The first one is what we call a free stroke, and that's all garnered from the wrist. So I throw uh -huh. the stick yeah. down, I the see. stick bounces back up into my hand, and that's the position that I'm playing at. Now the other one is something called molar technique, which starts with the elbow, brings my shoulder into play, and it looks like this. Now, that's if you powerful. listen to the difference... That's, that's, that's like a... That's like a... A bullwhip. Bull whip. Yes. So yeah. if I, I take my stick, and, and I hope the mic can pick it up. Here it is doing with the uh, with free stroke, what I call free strokes. Listen to what happens when I use molar. The amount of power I'm getting from the molar is dramatically higher than the other way. Now You can hear it. You can yeah, hear it. Yeah. And when Amy's talking about the technique she uses on harp and this rotational motion and bringing your fingers into a relaxed position. Or the piano, I'm watching him here. Now, as a student, I had a very interesting experience. My first harp lessons happened to be with a master. Unintentionally, I was just incredibly fortunate to end up with one of the best harp teachers in the country. My first piano lessons were with a rather ordinary piano teacher as far as level of technical understanding ability. And I ended up with this imbalance in technical understanding and application in the two instruments. My harp playing was, was much easier. I worked, it took me a while to grasp the technique, but I was taken through the best technique all the way. Yes. Whereas on the piano, I ended up with a lot of habits of tension and rigidity and misunderstanding. And then I cycled through multiple piano teachers in my student life. So I was always trying to find a good piano teacher. I did find good piano teachers, but not all of them understood how to help me sort out the technical difficulties yeah. I was having. And I remember one piano teacher really focused on what they call arm weight. Right. Well, if you get into piano technique, their arm weight is a whole school of thought. And for me, it was incredibly confusing because they were talking about arm weight as if you drop into the instrument. Right. Well, and complete relaxation. Well, it doesn't really work that way because if you, if you drop your whole arm weight into the instrument and you completely relax, you're in, you end up flaccid. You have, you have no control. Some years later, I ended up with a teacher who suddenly tied everything together and made everything make sense. And I had suddenly understood that it was exactly like the harp. Right. My hands work different, are, are traveling in different paths, but the principles are the same. And that is that it is not about a position. It is not about a technique. The whole principle is that of the transfer of energy. Yes. We have to think of music as being energy. Totally. And it's energy from the start to the end. It's energy sound waves traveling through the air that yep. strike our ears. It is energy coming off of the instrument, the vibration of the of the drum head, the vibration of the of the air waves coming off of the soundboard of the instrument, yep. whatever it is, it is energy. How, how do I create that energy? And it begins with the body. It's a very physical thing. And so all of this technique is about moving the energy through the body into the instrument in the most controlled, focused, and, and um, effective manner following the path of least resistance. And you hit the key. <laughs> it, it's this idea. The more relaxed you are, the faster you play. It's exactly. just the way it is. Because Once you don't you have muscles up, fighting against each exactly. other. Exactly. And let me demonstrate something for all of you. And you're going to see why this is so important. I, I showed you a few minutes, uh, minutes ago the molar technique. If I keep a loose grip in my hand, I can do something called the pumping motion. And this is what the pumping motion looks like. You're not hearing... No, they're all evenly spaced. One, two, three, one, two, three. I'm doing one motion. I'm not doing one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. One motion. That's, That's like what relaxation. we do at the piano. It's like one impetus, one impulse in, and then our fingers control and direct it where it needs to be. Exactly. Through the entire You're guiding pulse. it. So it's almost like I'm not in charge of any of this. 
physics is now taken over. Yeah. But watch what happens when I combine the hands. I can do an exercise and it's called interlacing. So I get the hand going. One, two, three, one, two, three. Then I'm gonna have my left hand. One, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three. Now what I'm gonna do with my left hand is I'm gonna relax it and let it do what the right hand is doing, but out of sync with it. So I'm now doing six notes for two movements, and then I can get... And look how relaxed you are. It's like yeah, it's my just, arms it's just are not flowing, through, flowing through your body. So, certainly, so... There's almost no energy. I can literally do that for an hour. I know because I've done it. Yeah, it or is, 60. It is the power of understanding technique. So you'll hear many musicians, and I know you've been mm -hmm. in this situation because so have I. Oh, technique, that's boring. Who needs it? I'm good enough. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, and then you can't play drums after 30 years because you buggered up all your wrists, your elbows, and your shoulders. But if you... examples? Uh, Phil Collins. Uh, Phil Collins no longer plays drums, um, and the reason that he's not playing drums is he injured himself because of technique issues. Um, my favorite drummer of all time, Neil Peart, when I watch him play, there's times he shrugs and I cringe and I think, oh yes, my God, yes, you're yes. gonna hurt yourself with that. Now, because he was doing it so often, and, but Neil also went for drum lessons later on in his life and started to learn some of these ideas of the flow and that I create the energy initially, but I maximize that energy through the instrument I'm not doing it. Exactly. You're simply creating it and then sending it on its way. And, 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 if it, and the more efficiently you send it on its way, the less resistance you, you create along its pathway, Exactly. then the more impactful it becomes when it actually comes out of the instrument so, into, the, uh, into the air. This control of energy, yes, you can let it get out of control. For example, here is what we call low molar. Very little motion, but you can see I'm still getting my three beats out of this. If I'm playing now a regular molar, it'd probably be more of this. You can see I'm a little higher. Again, you can see though it's starting at the elbow, but it results in the tip of the stick. Now, if I go to half molar, that's at about this level. If I go to full molar, which I don't use because I would break everything around me, is over the head. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of force that's there and I'm hoping you can hear this on the other end in, in the video. I'm going to play the stick. Try and listen to the note that the stick is made, making. I'm going to put my arms up close to the mic just so hopefully we can hear it. Hopefully you all heard this. Dun, dun, dun. Now watch what happens when I tighten up. It's, it's tight. You can feel the tightness in it. It deadens the sound. It does. There's, there's no resonance anymore. It's, it's because dry. It can't, yeah. It's what we call dry. And when you're playing on a drum set, you'll sometimes hear drummers and you say, oh my God, that drummer sounds so much better than that drummer, even though they're playing the same thing. And it's because one of them is relaxed and so the, the instrument is now ringing mm -hmm. and the other one's playing tight and driving into the equipment. And what happens is you end up breaking drumsticks. I go through maybe a set of drumsticks every six months, and I play pretty intense music. <laughs> I never break drum heads. I never break cymbals. I've never broken a cymbal in my life. I've seen other players that out there have blood on their hands from their practices, oh, oh. and they're just beating through it, and they're breaking all kinds of equipment. It's, you're breaking the equipment. That's okay, because I can replace that. But what happens when I break me? Yeah, yeah. That's... that's a really important point. Now what you were saying here about the how you get into it and that you were demonstrating the motions yeah. and all of that, that is something also that I find myself coming up against time and time again in my teaching where a student comes in and they have one of two ideas. Either they have the idea of what a real pianist looks like yep. and so they're creating all these gestures and artificial motions of what they think a pianist plays like but it has absolutely no connection to the sound they're producing right because for them it's just an imitation a mimicry of what they think is happening yep. or you have a student come in who feels like the motions they see are just for show and they don't want to be that way so they prefer to sit very still and not move anything. Right. Both of those illustrate the same problem that we 
don't understand what motion is all about in right. a player. And it comes back to this idea that we are sending the energy and the way in which we move, the way in which our bodies interact with the space around us and with the instrument itself is what determines the kind of sound so, that comes yes, out. Yes, yes, totally. The and quality so, of the sound. Exactly. So you have a fine pianist who maybe is making gestures. Maybe their hands are flying above and then they come down on the keys. Yeah. And an amateur or somebody who doesn't understand might think, why are they slamming down from there? But, but it's not them slamming down. It's, it's kind of what you said, the molar. Yeah. Where You're generating it's the this power travel from the shoulder through the true. whole shoulder. Yes. Or you can even, sometimes you'll even see a pianist, you know, as they're going to play a massive chord, they're actually up into it because yeah, the, the, yeah. the energy is coming from the feet through the yeah. whole body up through and it comes into the instrument that is very different from flailing your arms around and trying to look impressive. I, I totally agree. This motion is critical. And one of the other things too, and this isn't a sales pitch, so don't take it that way. Um, that's why you need a good teacher who knows what they're talking about, who understands Absolutely. technique. I can take someone who plays at a given speed and usually double their speed in about six weeks if they don't know the techniques that I happen to know. And that's because, again, think of it this way. Most of you out there may have heard of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee used to be able to do a one-inch punch and knock someone across the room. Buddy Rich, a famous drummer, was able to play single-stroke rolls with his left hand faster than I could play with both hands. Michael Jordan, when he used to go up to do a slam dunk, it seemed as though he stayed there forever in the air. That's because they've aligned their body and their energy to physics. Exactly, and, exactly. And once you understand how to do that alignment, so much more opens up to you as a musician. Anyway, sorry, and go I, ahead. I just, I just unzipped my harp here because I wanted to show, I wanted oh, to show, well, yeah. It's yeah, not... my, my, my harp, she's using my harp. I'm not even charging her for it, but she's gonna use my yeah, harp. This harp here, okay. <laughs> I, I want to show because the harp world is rife with this kind of misunderstanding where, where so many harpists end up with the idea that we need to move a certain way in the air. We need to have our hands in a certain position in order to achieve a certain effect. And that is not true. It has absolutely nothing to do with what motions you're going through in the air. It has nothing to do with whether your elbows are here or here. It has everything to do with how the energy is traveling through your body and if it's happening in a way that is healthy to the body so it's not going to damage you. And then you can put your force, you can direct that energy. I say force, I don't mean, I don't mean tension or fighting it. I'm just talking about the force of the energy, the, the impact, flow. the flow. The flow. Yeah. Going into the harp. Why do our hands move afterwards? It's the rebound effect. It's the continuation. You think of... You think, of, um, you think of simple momentum. And once you get something going, the energy has to dissipate. And if you stop it, halt it, then you are going to end up creating tension and, and inhibit, inhibiting what comes next. And damaging right? yourself. And damaging in the yourself. So, yes, there is going to be all kinds of motion. And the, the beautiful thing is, those harpists who forget about trying to make themselves look elegant and focus on the actual mechanical, physics, biomechanical, scientific needs of what it is that creates and, and transfers the, the energy and makes it come out in this beautiful sound, who are not thinking about how they look to the mm -hmm. audience. Those are the ones who end up looking so at one yeah, with the music yeah, yeah, totally. because they are it's no longer a show it's no it's no longer theatrics it's no longer you know something that i stack on top to make myself look elegant it's, yeah no it's, no it's, no it's yeah. you know it's all about how do we move to get the sound we want and every part of our movement is is focused towards either rebounding and recovering from what was just done or preparing and regrouping to apply what comes next. Uh, agreed. And what it does, again, is it, it, it allows you to do things that no, normal people or other musicians can't do. And here's an example. 
Amy brought up a really good comment there, which applies to her and applies to me as a drummer. Rebound. When I drop a stick onto the drum head and it bounces, uh -huh. it'll bounce X number of times, which is just great. Most drummers that play tighten up on their stick and what they do, they throw the stick down at the drum head, they tighten up and then they pull the stick back up. Whereas I just throw down the stick and watch. You'll see the stick gets back up before my hand does, watch. Now, what ends up happening as you move through that and you start to get faster and more efficient in your playing is it becomes more apparent, the more relaxed you are, the faster things start happening. But here's a test I give to all of my young students when they're starting out. It's the first area of technique that they do. Watch what happens when I throw the stick down now. See that position? And for those of it's you who are- completely reversed, yeah. Yeah, if those of you out there who know who Buddy Rich is and understand it, my teacher, Dom Famulero, once met Dom or met uh, Buddy and they were chatting about this. And Buddy was not the most pleasant human being. And Dom <laughs> asked him to show him something on the drums. And he got all upset about, about it and said, I don't have to prove myself to you. You're just a kid. Well, Dom's teacher, Al Miller, who's a very famous drummer from the New York area, who's a friend of Buddy, said, let the, go easy on the kid, just show him something. And so Buddy went in front of uh, uh, Dom and got about this far from his face. And he said, I'm gonna show you how this ha works. Either you get it or you don't, I don't care, but don't ever ask me again to do this. And this <laughs> okay. is what Buddy did. He did that. And so Dom is looking at Al Miller thinking, what the hell did I just see? And, Al Miller said, don't worry, we'll talk about it later. And that's what he was showing him, this relaxation, whoops, where the stick comes uh -huh, all the way back. Uh -huh. And that proves that I'm totally relaxed because if I'm tense right, or I don't get my right, fingers right, out right. of the way, the stick can't come back. Mm -hmm. So you've right, got to be uh -huh. relaxed to let the stick come back. Heavy metal drummers especially are guilty of this. They drive into things. No, for a heavy metal drummer, it's even more important. And in contemporary music, because if not, when I hit down hard and I'm not relaxed, that vibration travels up into my, well, into my knuckles, into my wrist, into my elbow, and into my shoulder. And then we wonder why people have ligament issues and destroying muscles and bloody hands. In Tendons fact, and messed up wrists. You can tell them right now. Touch my, just stroke my hand. Now, yeah. you know I'm a heavy metal drummer. How many calluses or damaged parts no, of my I hand. I don't feel. really feel anything. My hands are like really a baby's bum. They are so soft. Why? Because the technique I've been trained by guys like Joe Morello and Jim Chapin and Dom Famulero, who were some of the best in the world, and they studied with the best. Sanford Augustus Moeller, George Lawrence Stone, and I know you don't know any of these names, but if you wish, Go on to Google and Google some of these names. These were the masters of this instrument. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to learn from them. Because of that, I was able to play drum set for 60 hours straight without hurting myself or getting tired. That's just wonderful. I, I could have, had I not have needed sleep, I probably could have gone on for 120 hours. But it's, I, I recommend, especially to the musicians out there, or for those of you who are uh, here with Amy and I and may not be musicians, Number one, you are never too old to learn a, an never instrument. Never too old. Never, never too old. Pick it never. up. Do it. Do it. If you love it, if you dream of it, just do it. Both of you. Um, how old was your oldest ever student? Um, you're um, never too old. And how old was your oldest student? I, I was trying to think because I told you 72, but then I think I remember that I had another, another one who was in her later 70s. So getting close to 80, but... And my oldest student was 84. She was a flute student. And other, since she was a kid, she wanted to play the flute. Probably the same situation as yours. I cannot tell you the number of people where I'll get off of a performance and people come up to me and say, oh my God, you're such a great drummer and I wish I could do what you do. And it's, If you wish for it, go now, do it. Why, 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 are you not, why are you not doing it? Now, there could be financial issues or a host of other things, but normally it's just, Maybe well, I could never do that. issues or work issues or whatever, but don't ever think that you can't no, do it. No, anybody can do and this. here's the beautiful thing about the age we live in. You're no longer limited to the teachers you have around you. That's right. You have access to incredible world-class teaching by going online because 
and this is, I don't mean this as an advertisement for myself or for Carl. Right, no, I get it. I don't care if, if nobody ever calls me and says, please teach me online. I just want you to understand that there are fine, fine teachers out there in all parts of the world who work online and they can teach you just as well as if you were in person. Yes. And it's just the beauty of technology in the world we live in. I was, I was going to say, um, when you were showing the rebound, I was going to show, I know this isn't a harp channel, but I'm a harpist, I have to show you. <clears throat> How does this tension that he's talking about, um, where he, he says gripping and then stopping, how does it show up on the harp? It can show up in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways it often shows up is when your fingers don't fall completely shut after you have plucked a string. If there is, if there is tension, you're going to stop that continuous motion which takes your hand closed. You've just exerted quite a bit of force on this string, and the rebound is that the string vibrates, your hand follows through with the motion to closure. If you find that you're struggling to close your hand, or that your fingers want to curl like this, or a pinky wants to stick up, or a thumb wants to hook, or any number of things, or if you find that your forearms hurt, or your wrists hurt, or, or your, you can't cross a scale, or, or maybe doing a trill is impossible for you and you feel like your fingers get all tangled, it's not because you can't do it. It's because you haven't yet learned. Perhaps nobody has been able to show you. Perhaps you haven't done the careful practice necessary. It all depends on circumstances. But something hasn't yet taught you that there is a way to travel through space in your body that gets the result you want. And it's a combination of having a teacher who knows how to guide you and being willing to do the work. Exactly, and, and the emphasis being on a teacher who knows how to guide you. Yes. Um, the number, I've had many, many students who've come from other drum teachers. They've moved from, say, Calgary, Alberta, come to Ontario. Uh, Dom always recommends me as a teacher in the London region. Um, and so they hear about me and they come for lessons. And some of the things I see it's painful to watch. It's horrifying. And it's where where did you where did you learn? And you're always very pleasant about it. But it's, yes. Where did you learn to do that? And Who taught oh, well, you that? Well, my teacher showed me, or they've never taken lessons. They say, well, that's what so and so and so and so does. Or I've taught myself how to do that, and I feel I think I'm yeah, pretty good at it. Yeah, it looks like now. it, and it looks like it. And when you're young and 18 years of age, doing this will be fine for you. And you're my age and doing it this way, this no longer works. There, I'm totally relaxed. Look at my elbows, down, relax at my side. I, I'm seeing you, I'm seeing you here. When you're doing this, your whole body stiffens. When you do this, you suddenly become erect. Yeah. And I, I can breathe. Your spine I can is breathe. natural, you're breathing. It's I can all, it's breathe all now. And breathing is kind of important. Um, so <laughs> we want to make sure. And see, this is a service announcement, if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Go. So, so I, I'm not a musician, I don't play any instrument. Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to get to a conclusion. Okay. Uh -huh. Yep. And now you tell me if my conclusion is right or wrong. Go ahead. Okay. Playing an instrument, it's a natural thing. Yes. 100%. Yep. The most accomplished musicians, the ones that have the highest level of ability, are the ones who have been able to do it in the most natural way. And, and we start with beginners. They might be very small, little tots. They might be 70-year-olds or 80-year-olds or anything in between. The biggest challenge to progressing and developing your technique is learning to stay out of the way. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I could expand that stay and say also, I could expand that to also say the biggest challenge to performing well is learning to stay out of the way, not only physically, but mentally. Sure, yes. But both of those, the more natural your approach, the more successful you will be, and then it's simply learning how to direct that very fundamentally natural movement. And, and one, one other point too that goes along with this is that if you watch musicians, 
the best musicians make it look easy. They'll be doing things that if you try to copy them, what they're doing, you're going to go, there's, there's no, no way. way I can ever do that. No way. Right. Any of us can do it. It's just understanding that, no, there are techniques at play there which you don't necessarily understand, which allow the instrumentalist to remain totally relaxed. And this relaxed. brings us back to what you were saying before about technique. Technique doesn't matter because, and I think this is a very easy place to misunderstand. Technique doesn't mean something artificial. No. Technique means natural and using the natural in the best way possible. Learn the technique means to learn how to get out of the way. That's part of it. And, yes. And learn how to use what you've got in a way that makes sense to your body. Which is why it's also possible to take somebody whose body doesn't, norm, doesn't work the way most of ours works. Like the disabled ones you work with. Yes. Like somebody with with um with injuries like somebody with muscle disorders like somebody or have brain injuries brain as well. injuries or even somebody who has repetitive stress injuries sure, certainly carpal tunnel if if you're doing it right it can actually be incredibly healing and therapeutic if somebody's missing a finger doesn't mean they can't play the, play an instrument no if their fingers are stiff and rigid doesn't mean they can't play an instrument yeah vlad saying black sabbath guitarist um Tony, uh, Tony, yeah, he, he was missing a finger. Well, it was on his um, fret hand, yep, I believe. Fret hand. It was his, but I still, believe it was his index finger. that's a bit of a problem until you learn how to work with it. And the idea is make it natural for the body. And that doesn't mean untrained. No. It doesn't mean disorganized. Because very often what we think of as natural, we think just, you know, okay, I can just go throw myself at the instrument and, and hope that it comes out. Certainly. Technique means organizing the natural. And technique is not a bad word. Yeah. Um, speaking of a drummer who has a bit of a disadvantage is Rick Allen from Def Leppard who lost, lost his left arm and then he had to, had to relearn to play the drum set more using his feet with his hand and electronics. Fortunately, they were available in order to produce the same thing. But I want to give one more indication to all of you before I shut up with my stories. Kenny Arnoff is the most sought, was the most sought after uh, studio musician in the world. He still may be. But he's played with everyone from uh, his big one was John Cougar Mellencamp, but he's played with uh, Alice Cooper, Alanis Morissette, all of these drummers. When he was out on tour one, one time, and I'm going to move my drum pad, he does something called a rim shot where he comes down and he hits the rim of the drum and the center of the snare drum at the same time. I'm not going to do it in here because it's too hard on the ears. Kenny was doing it so hard, he was actually breaking the rims wow. of the drums, which are made of metal. And he was using what are called die cast rooms, which are he they're the heaviest ones you could get. He broke three of them in like a two month period. He started having problems with his left hand, which is what he was striking with. So he went to Dom Famulero, because most of us go to Dom Famulero when we got problems <laughs> with our playing. And he said, can you tell me? So Dom said, well, go and get some blood tests and let's find what's going on. So he went to his doctor, they did blood tests. They found there were ligaments from his wrist in his blood. You're not supposed to have ligaments. That's not a good sign. And it was from this whack, stiff, and that's what was breaking sticks, breaking heads, and breaking uh, the rims. Mm -hmm. He went to Dom for lessons for like four or five lessons, learned to play very relaxed with a relaxed motion. Bang. Pain went away. Drums not breaking Blood all the time. Blood cleared up. Yeah, and so not only is he saving money on the equipment, but he's also saving himself, and I would put money uh, on it that his sound got better because now he's playing in a relaxed, right, 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 in a relaxed way. But you, it is difficult. Most people do not do it naturally, which is ironic because we're trying to get you to be natural. But through society, as you grow up, you learn these habits which make you stiff. Breathing, or is maybe a big, a, maybe yeah, it's just a visual thing. You know, like for example, piano. I I teach piano. I play piano. When somebody comes to learn to play the piano, they have this idea simply because of the way the instrument looks yep. and the way the instrument works, that the way to play piano is to press the keys down. Right. If you go to play the piano with the idea that it's time to push the keys down, you are going to destroy yourself in the process and be frustrated and never progress beyond a, a certain level because that is not how it works. 
it has to be a forwards motion. And as the key, as the hand moves through this bullwhip action, which you were yep, just demonstrating, it's now going to be a slower motion. But let's say this is the piano. Yep. I go in. As as I travel into the key, you see the the continuation of the mo movement here. And so rather than coming down onto the key, I am moving up forwards into the piano. Yes. And I am suddenly one with the instrument. And and that's what the that's just an, another small example of how it's easy to get confused if you don't know what you're doing about what natural really means. Uh, totally. And uh, to, to follow on with what you're saying, the drum uh, the, the synonym on the drums Again, it's a smaller technique. If I put my stick over the drum here, if I do what's called an upstroke, which is an up, upward mov movement of my arm, watch what happens. Well, yeah. hold on, let's try that again. Makes perfect sense. What this sense. means is I can now come down, strike the drum, and as I start coming up, I can hit twice. Exactly, I, and that's how you the can... work and getting double the, the profit or double the, the result not just by that. knowing one movement. Not only that, the music suddenly becomes much more human, much more flexible, much more expressive because it's no longer a constant barrage of tension and attack. And rigid notes. And rigidity. Suddenly, it, it, there's, a, there's a rise and a fall, a cadence to yes. the to the music. It breathes. It breathes. It's breathing. And it speaks and it sings. Yes. Because that's the way our voices do. And you were just going to mention something about breathing. Yeah, because if you look at a baby, and very shortly, Amy's going to have lots of time <laughs> to do that. When yes. a baby's lying on its back, which I don't recommend, no, it's laying on the front causes SIDS. Yes, you lay them on their back. Your child is laying on the back. Sit and watch the movement of the body and you'll see the stomach raises near the stomach because it's actually the diaphragm. The diaphragm raises and the diaphragm drops. As we get older, we learn, unfortunately, more to breathe from our chest and you'll see this because this is what it looks like. The shoulders go right, up. Right, right. But let me take that even a step further. Sure, go ahead. Because this is something that, again, if somebody goes and tries to breathe like a baby, I will tell you, you won't be entirely successful. Why? Because a baby is not yet erect. Right. And when we become erect, our abdominal core muscles suddenly have to support us as well. Yep. And so if we were trying to do the natural thing of breathing exactly like a baby, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Yet we have to use that diaphragm. Yes. And so... So again, it's a, it's a development which hopefully we learn through our childhood and we live in an environment that allows it, but society puts us in, in, a, in an environment where we often lose those skills as we're developing. Yes. And, and that's why we end up And rigid. my point is, is breathing from yes. up here as opposed to breathing exactly. down here exactly. where you should be breathing from because that is natural. But we, for many of us, we've been taught not to be natural. And a really good instructor will teach you how to relax and become totally at one with your surroundings. Exactly. So that when you're playing, it's... Feel and I'll tell you, when you start to learn the technique, which again is not a bad word, playing gets so much more pleasurable. It's easy to do things you couldn't do before. It feels so much more relaxed. You're not tension filled. Now, there'll still be tension for nerves and things like this, but considerably less than when you haven't learned these particular and techniques. And practice becomes enjoyable. Totally. Satisfying, rewarding. Um, as a student, sometimes somebody would ask, would ask me, what do you love most about playing the harp? My answer was always, I love practicing. Yeah. I love to practice. Well, I love it for a lot of different reasons, but if I, I went through a phase with my piano, as I, as I alluded to earlier, where I had technical difficulties and, and misunderstandings and tensions, and I would get so frustrated yep. that I didn't want to sit down and practice. And if you, again, this is the teacher and me speaking, if you have a child who is taking lessons and they're frustrated and they don't want to practice, Think about the possibility that maybe they need somebody who can help them discover how their body is rewarded and satisfied in interacting with an instrument 
in the natural way and see if maybe finding someone like that will change your child's attitude towards practice. And I'd like to finish up with one more recommendation for mm -hmm. the audience. My favorite guitarist is a gentleman by the name of Ingvi Malmsteen. Um, the guy's speed and facility on the instrument honestly is like nobody else's. He's just very unique. There's a, a program on YouTube that you can go to called Cracking the Code. And it's by Troy Grady as the guitarist. And what he does is he, when he first started listening to Ingvi Malmsteen, he tried to play like him and he found he couldn't. And it did not matter how much practice he did, how slowly he played it, and for how long he wasn't able to play with the facility mm -hmm. and the sound of mm -hmm. Ingve. Mm -hmm. He actually ended up getting videos where he was zeroing in on what is he actually doing. And he learned about something called slant picking, which I'm not going to go into here. By learning that technique that Ingve was doing, after some significant practice, but using this, he found he could now play Ingve Malmsteen riffs. Now, yes, it, I'm speculating here, but I would argue that had he have not learned that technique, he would never have been able to play what Ingve was doing. He may have been able to reproduce something that was similar, right, right, but not with the relaxation and the fluidity that he learned from slant picking. So I that makes perfect sense. I recommend to all of you check out. It's called Cracking the Code. It's on YouTube. Start at number one, and it's great because all of you people, all of you that really love Randy Rhodes and Eddie Van Halen and all these guys, he talks about all of them and how he went through this development. Anyway, that's that all I have cool. to say on that front. <laughs> well, we could actually keep talking about technique and go on and on all night. But, yeah, we could. But I think this is kind of what we were, our, how our conversation started, and this is the main part of the topic. And yes. Thanks to Vlad for catching this on video. I think probably a lot of you will enjoy it and perhaps even benefit from it. And maybe in the future we'll bring up the subject again. But we for might now decide... you've got the fundamentals, yes, I think. Yes, yes, yes. And um, thank you for indulging us. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you next time.